we're very comfortable with the idea of selling things like cars and motorcycles with the idea of being sexy. And a lot of people have taken that saying, okay, well, we need to make public transport more exciting, so let's try and sell public transport in a way that makes it sexy as well. Interesting approach. But I want to take, because I'm, I'm, I'm a biologist, I'm allowed to talk about sex, and so I want to take a different view of the idea of sexy. I want to talk about getting deeply sexy. What does that mean? Well, you need to understand what sex is all about. So sex in the world that we live in, the biological world, has a job, and that job is to be the meat grinder of innovation for big things like us. We're in this arms race with little things, bacteria that reproduce much faster than us, so sex is actually the mechanism by a big by which big, long-lived stuff like us can actually innovate fast enough to keep up with the small things. So it's got a job. So inside sex is two big things. One of those is the desire to engage in innovation. It's also a mechanism for innovation. So that mechanism of innovation is quite simple. Basically it says, take one set of ideas, take another set of ideas, combine the two together to produce a third thing, and then test that third thing in the real world to see if it works. So when I talk about getting deeply sexy with transport, I say, how do we think about public transport in a way that means we have a deep desire for innovation and we understand a simple mechanism for doing that, which is bringing together two sets of ideas that we haven't brought together before and seeing what happens and testing that in the real world. Sounds like fun? So I can guarantee you that the next set of slides would not be quite as racy as the first one. Let's actually start. Let's do this ourselves, because I think this is interactive. It's dig, you know, digital interactive. So let's have a think of the interactive bit. Here's a historical example for you, just to get you in the space. So very quickly, in the next 30 seconds, introduce yourself to the person beside you. If you're not sitting beside you, it's a nice chance to move somewhere and meet someone. What would happen if we combine two sets of quite independent technologies? One is the ability to walk on a city street, and the other one is the idea of rail transportation. If you were to combine those two together, what new sort of thing would you get? Talk to the person beside you. You've got a whole 30 seconds to come up with a suggestion of what that might be. How are we going? Any suggestions? I've got some people doing the sort of like, you know, pumpy wheelie machines. Very exciting. Yep. A travelator. If you wanted to have a really high speed travelator that went long distances, what would you call that? You would call that a city metro. So City Metro combines the idea of being able to walk in a city with a train which is designed for mass scale passenger transport. Being designed for mass scale tra passenger transport means it has lots of doors, you can get on and off it very quickly. And in doing so, you've built the nearest thing to a, um, to a transporter. You basically walk down a hole, you reappear somewhere five minutes later in a city. Amazing technology, been around for about 100 years or so, and it's bringing together those two separate ideas to produce a third outcome which turns out to be the underpinning of all mass large scale cities. Interesting. Okay, so that's an example of how bringing two ideas together produces an outcome which gives you new capability in the world. So let's have a think about a lot of the technology when we talk about transport, we talk about things uh, like, you know, trams, trains, cars, all those sort of things which actually existed in the 1930s. But we're trying to plan transport system for the 2030s. So let's think about what are the new technologies that are coming on stream and how can we move those into the transport system, what new capabilities that give us. So, some of the new big technologies that have moved on board are really all in the digital space. So, we have uh, batteries. So, the battery that goes in your mobile device is actually a lithium-ion battery, and that's actually spawned a whole bunch of R&D, which has now developed large-scale, uh, low-cost traction batteries that can be used for moving things around. We also have uh, the growth of wireless networks. So, you know, 30 years ago, there wasn't actually a wireless network. You couldn't actually pull out your phone and call anyone on the fly, but now that's actually appearing. That's uh, got quite good coverage. Uh, mixed with the mobile wireless networks, we have mobile wireless devices. Uh, and uh, on the side there, things like Google Earth have managed to put together large-scale mapping things that then connects with GPS in your phone, and so now you've actually got uh, good appearance for navigation. And then last but not least, we have a whole bunch of low-cost sensors, so things like cameras, radars, those kind of things, and artificial intelligence that sits behind that, which lets us develop something like automation. So all of those things are here, and they're improving very quickly. So the question is, what happens when we start to put these into the transport system? Now, part of the transport system is already thinking about this. Part of the transport system that knows how to be sexy, which is the car makers, have already been sorting about thinking about this. And so what we actually have now is trying to work out how we jam all of that stuff into the private passenger car. 
here's another chance to be interactive. So talk to the person beside you. So if you jam all of that technology into the private passenger car, what new sort of device, what new thing do you think that gives you? Have a quick talk beside you. Have a suggestion. Where do you think the private passenger car is heading as we stuff technology into it? Any suggestions? Cars that talk to each other so they don't crash. Any other suggestions? Autonomous vehicle. It's like you've read my slide. There you go. It's the autonomous passenger car. So in fact, if you look at all of the images in that, uh, those pictures, all of those are autonomous cars. Uh, the one on the left there is, uh, sorry, the one on your right is, uh, is one from Nissan. That's an all-electric autonomous car. The one up the top is one from Toyota. The one on the left here is a car from Google on the side here. That car's already done about a million kilometers of on-road testing in traffic. Already happened. The one down the bottom is actually a, an Audi race car that's fitted out by Stanford University and is now uh, currently trying to set lap records around a racetrack. So this technology is here, and it's coming at us like a steam train. The question is, does this put us in a fundamentally new place in terms of the transport system? Well, to do that, we need to understand what are the key challenges of the transport system. So let's have a think about things. So if we think about our transport system, in New South Wales, for example, this uh, graphic on the, on the left here uh, says that, yes, cars are really the backbone of our transport system in New South Wales. Uh, in Sydney, uh, area with the best public transportation, still 68% of trips are by the private passenger car. Uh, up in the Hunter, it grows to 82. So pretty much, you know, the bulk of trips are actually done by the private passenger car. So if you've got an improvement to the private passenger car, that could sound like it's important. One of the issues, though, is that while we're completely dependent on the private passenger car, there's a small issue. That's that we don't actually make cars and we don't actually have any oil. So that means that for New South Wales, being dependent on the private passenger car also means that 20% of our imports are actually used each year in the consumables for the transport sector. So if you think about the entire revenue from the coal sector, for example, that we all come in, that's not actually available to spend on your infrastructure because we actually spend all of that on cars and send it offshore again. So we have this, this huge structural leakage, about $16 billion a year, which is leaking money out of the New South Wales economy. So this is not just a problem for New South Wales, this is actually a problem for Australia. So if you have a look at this graphic on the left here, the graphic on the left here, this is uh, car production or vehicle production for uh, use in Australia. The sort of the, the filled in sections there, the blue, the red and the green up the top, that's actually imported vehicles. So the blue one is imported uh, passenger vehicles, the uh, red one is imported SUVs and the green one up the top is imported heavy vehicles. The Australian production is actually that sort of hash stuff down the bottom. So you can see that over the last decade or so, Australian production has crashed. We're down to about 20% of production of all of the vehicles that we consume each year. So while New South Wales has no vehicle production, it's actually kind of representative of where Australia is heading. At the same time here, on the right-hand side for you, you see the sort of blue line up the top that's crashing down. That's actually Australia's domestic oil production. It's been sort of hammering along, hammering along, and now is actually falling off a cliff as Bass Strait dries up. At the same time, the yellow line is actually the price that we pay for importing oil. And you can see that that's actually risen. It's grown by about 500% in the last decade. So while New South Wales is in this position, it's actually fairly indicative of where the rest of the nation is heading. So there's this big structural issue that's appearing in our economy because the situation has changed. Our oil is going down, our manufacturing of vehicles is going down, and the price of oil is going up. So that means that transport based on the private passenger car is now costing us a lot of money. So the question when we look at this new car coming on, this autonomous car, I think autonomous cars are going to be awesome, but do they actually solve that large-scale issue in our trade deficit? The answer is not really. They don't really approach that. They stay dependent on the private passenger car, which means they stay dependent on imports. They're not going to suddenly manufacture cars we haven't manufactured before. So how do we think about this in a different way and think about if we get that same suite of technology and bang it into something else in the transport system, can we get somewhere else? So let's actually start with the public transport system. That's kind of fun. So this is a bus. You've seen a bus before. What happens if we actually get a bus and stick a battery in it? Pretty straightforward example. You would probably get a battery electric bus. In fact, this is a battery electric bus operating already in South Australia. This is the Tito bus. They recharge this from solar power. Why is that an exciting idea? Is it ridiculously cheaper? No. Uh, does it actually um, does it reduce our reliance on imports? Well, you a little bit of diesel, you don't have to import anymore. But the cost of the bus was higher, and you probably imported that, so it's about the same. But it does make one big difference. And that's that at the moment we're trying to build these communities, which are you know like what we call livable communities. You know, you hang out in the street, talk to friends, wonderful things to do. 
And then we stick a really big diesel engine beside them and say, have a nice time. So the one big advantage that the electric bus gives you is actually quiet. It doesn't make any noise, doesn't put out any pollution, makes communities a nicer place to live. At the moment we haven't worked out how to actually include that in the economics for when we buy buses. So we're busily spending money on communities to make them more livable, and then putting big diesel motors in them to make them less livable, and we haven't worked out how to convert that over to electric and put that as a price in the electric system. But if we do, it gives an advantage, and that advantage is it creates a more livable community. It doesn't change the big picture issue, but does change the micro issue. But what if we were to take that same bus and add some automation to that, which is supported by a wireless network? Well, that gives you something kind of interesting. At a minimum level of automation, this is basically drawing a line on the road, you can actually form an autonomous tram which will ride on the road and just follow a line for you. So this has automatic stop technology, just like the stuff that's in your car that you can buy off the shelf nowadays. So stuff can detect things. All it does is follow a line on the road, travels along. It's the reason why you want it to be automation is because you actually have a really long vehicle that's difficult for a person to drive. If you want it to go on exactly the same track each time, you automate it, get it to follow a line. Well, does that get you anywhere especially different? The interesting thing is if you want to put a light rail system in, more than half the cost is the cost of laying the track. That's the expensive bit of light rail. It's not actually the vehicle, it's the cost of laying the track. So here, the cost of the track is a line on a road. It completely revolutionises the cost base for light rail. Interesting. So what if you were to take something like that, it's a road-based driverless tram, and you were to add something like the ability to navigate. So that's what you've got all these tram stops around the place. And normally a tram will just follow you know, on a set route around all of those tram stops. If you could add the ability to navigate, what would that do? Well, I reckon it does something really quite interesting. It gives you something called personal rapid transit. If you can navigate, you can now get into the tram and say, I don't want to follow the whole tram route, I just want you to take me to that tram station. If you want to do that, well, why would you have something the size of a tram when you should have something size the size that you want to drive in, so you have something that's a much smaller vehicle that now can go between tram stop and tram stop? This is called personal rapid transit. The trick here is that normally to build personal rapid transit, you have to build a dedicated rail line for it. But what the new technology lets us do around autonomous vehicles is to put that on the road in traffic, which means there's no infrastructure cost. So you now have an autonomous point-to-point -point on-demand transport service with no infrastructure cost. Interesting. So what would happen if you took that on road and you added a, per uh, a personal mobile device? What does the per personal mobile device let you do? Well, your personal mobile device knows where you are and you can tell it where you want to go. That means you don't need to stop. But what you actually have now is an anywhere to anywhere personal rapid transit system. You say, I'm here, I want to go there, the vehicle appears, you get in, it takes you to where you want to go, and then moves on. Sounds kind of like an autonomous car, doesn't it? But there's a big difference. So the big difference is, is that if we look at the ownership model, it's quite different. Here is a, a nice uh, graph of costs for owning a private passenger car. So if you look on the right-hand side there, that's a private passenger car. The colours, the blue down the bottom, is really the capital cost. When you buy a private passenger car, it's active for about 5% of the time. The rest of the time, all that capital that you spent in the car is sitting there doing nothing, or at worst, actually taking up space that costs money in the community. So a car is useful when you're using it, there's actually a negative when you're not using it, and you're not using it for 95% of the time. Of course, you actually pay for the car twice. If it's a private passenger car, you pay for it once in depreciation, and you pay for it a second time with insurance. So that means that the costs associated with ownership of the car to the individual are really quite high, and the only reason we do it is because we don't have something to compete with it in terms of usability. There is something else around that tries to compete, and that's, of course, a taxi. The issue with a taxi is it has a dedicated driver, and you have to pay the driver. So you're sharing the cost of the vehicle, but you do have to pay the driver, and the driver's, you know, surprise enough, in a first world country asks for money, and so therefore, the cost of the taxi is more expensive than a private car if you travel more than about 30 kilometres per day. If you travel substantially less than that, it's cheaper not to have a car and just to hire a taxi. But what does this anywhere to anywhere person rapid transit allows? Well, it allows you to share the car, just like a taxi, but you don't have to pay for the taxi driver. That revolutionises the cost. 
You pull all that cost out, and so now you have a technique which can take you from anywhere to anywhere at lower cost than owning a private car. Interesting. So, what does that get us? Well, if you have something that is more effective than the private car, or of course, if you're actually in a private car, you've got hands on the wheel, if you've got hands on the wheel, you can't use your mobile device, so you've lost value. Now you're in an autonomous vehicle where you don't have to drive the car, so that actually means that you gain value. So you're gaining value in traveling in something that's actually cheaper. At the same time, because you're sharing the vehicles, you've actually divided the number of vehicles by about 10, which means you've actually reduced all of those things about imports by about an order of magnitude. It now suddenly stops being an issue. If you're thinking about electrification, the economics of electrification are interesting. You take a battery, which is really, really expensive, and you match it with the fuel, which is quite cheap, which is electricity. And so what you're trying to do is to actually drive enough miles in the car so that the savings on electricity pay for the cost of the battery. So in a private car, you don't actually drive very far, but you all want to always want the opportunity to drive a long way, so you want a huge battery and you don't want to drive it very fast. You're not earning much to pay for the battery, so it's really hard to make the economics of the private electric car work. But this is a shared car, so you're driving a lot of kilometres, you're making a lot of saving to actually pay for the cost of the battery. What does that mean? It means that the economics for electrification of these vehicles is much more viable than the economics of the private passenger car, and it's much more likely to happen. So you're likely to have two things. One is you've actually reduced the uh, import spend on private motor vehicles because you're, you're importing about one-tenth the number. The other one is you're not actually importing any oil anymore because you're running on your own domestic electricity system because the economics of electricity of electrification makes sense. So they've actually solved both of those problems. Interestingly, when you have your mobile device and you've booked a trip to somewhere else, if you have a centralised system that understands what's happening there, it can automatically do trip sharing or ride sharing for you. So if you're, if you're urgent, you can say, take me private. But the default would be, if someone else is going the same journey in the way, pick them up on the way. That actually, in, in uh, peak times, reduces congestion. So you solve the congestion problem, the noise problem, the in particular emissions problem, the car ownership import problem, and the oil problem. Interesting. So smashing a whole bunch of digital technology into the public transport vehicle puts us in a very, very different space strategically. Oh, I've gone blank. So what that gives us is a, a clear idea of the strategic direction. If we can work out how to thread all of these technologies together, each one of them gives you some, uh, some advantage, and it's heading towards something that you know is solving a big, large-scale structural issue, and therefore is probably worth backing. If you want to do this, this is a high-risk strategy. You're not going to be able to just say, I guarantee that all of these things will come off, and you can't implement, none of this is on the shelf that you can pull off and implement straight away. That means you need to think about how you do that for a, for a statewide transport system. You really need to think about how you do this at a small scale. How do you test bed it? How do you make sure these technologies at small scale are brought online, are tested, the bugs are ironed out so that you can work out how to scale it up? That means actually building an innovation cluster that can handle all of those problems. If you want to do that, you want to put that somewhere. You probably wouldn't want to put it in the place where you have the most congestion if something goes wrong, it all falls apart. So you wouldn't want to put this in the middle of Sydney, but you might want to put it in a satellite city that has good connections to an innovative base and a manufacturing base and is looking at how to revolutionise its own city by actually having a big redevelopment and thinking about transport actively. Maybe Newcastle and the Hunter is the place to be that test bed for New South Wales and Australia if we position ourselves properly. I reckon that is sexy transport. Thanks a lot, guys. If you want to talk to me, I'll be downstairs later on. Cheers.